All right. What a fabulous and lively conversation that was. Thank you very much to Elena and all the panelists that she was speaking to. It's now absolutely wonderful to be able to um, introduce you or segue into the African Women Leaders in Business and Government section of our event. Um, this session is going to be about hearing thoughts from Africa. You know, as the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed women's leadership during times of crisis and especially, is especially crucial. This session is going to put a spotlight on the power and the potential of women's leadership across Africa, bringing together um, leading voices from business and government. The session will highlight how African women leaders are driving inclusive policies and investments, and we'll explore common barriers to advancing women's leadership, opportunities in government and business, and consider how strength and partnership and mutual accountability can accelerate efforts to advance progress towards gender equality across public and private sectors. It's um, a pleasure to be able to introduce Kravani Pillay, Development Coordination Specialist for Partnerships and Development Finance at the UN Office of the Resident Coordinator in South Africa. She will host this session. Over to you, Kravani. Thank you very much, Veronica. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Your Excellencies, networks and members of the UN Global Compact from around the world, ambassadors, representatives of the private sector, civil society, members of academia, UN agencies, all protocol observed, and allow me to say all time zones observed as well. My name is Kravani Pele, and I'm the Partnerships Officer at the UN Resident Coordinator's Office in South Africa. And it is my pleasure and honor to moderate the session entitled The Power and Potential of Women's Leadership in Government and Business Perspectives from Africa as part of the UN Global Compact Leaders Summit. I have the most enviable panel of speakers this afternoon. They are leading voices from business and private sectors, uh, a business and private sector. And this session is going to explore how women's leadership in the public and private sectors can help drive the policies and investments needed to tackle the world's greatest challenges and build back better, stronger, and more inclusive from the pandemic. And I would fail in my duty if I did not spotlight the UN Global Compact's Target Gender Equality Program the TGE is for participating companies of the UN Global Compact and supports these companies in setting and reaching ambitious corporate targets for women's representation and leadership, starting with the board and executive management levels. The program achieves this through facilitated performance analysis, capacity building workshops, peer-to-peer -peer learning, and multi-stakeholder dialogue at country level. The topic up for discussion is obviously tied to SDG 5 on gender equality, a goal that calls for the achievement of gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. In order for us to achieve our targets in this and all 17 goals, we know all too well the need for a whole of government and whole of society approach if we are to meet the 2030 agenda. In April last year, the UN Secretary General cautioned that the gains made in gender equality and women's rights over the decade are in danger of being rolled back due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And he urged governments to put women and girls at the center of their recovery efforts. With this in mind, it is imperative that women's representation and leadership across business, government, and all spheres of society is essential to achieving sustainable and inclusive development. Yet, despite the increased recognition that women bring unique and valuable perspectives to decision-making, globally, women still face significant barriers to accessing leadership roles and remain critically underrepresented. Did you know that according to a study published by the University of Dublin, between January and May 2020, women-led countries suffered six times fewer confirmed COVID-19 deaths than countries led by men. The COVID-19 pandemic revealed that women's leadership during times of crisis is especially crucial. And to help put all of this into context for us is our esteemed panelists. Her Excellency, 
Dr. Monique Nsanza Baganwa, the Deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission. She was elected the 34th African Union Assembly for a fourth term and is the first woman to hold this position. She has over 20 years experience developing and leading programs that drive financial inclusion and economic prosperity and has supported various gender empowerment initiatives. Our second guest, Mr. Olukayode Pitten, is the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Bank of Industry, Nigeria's oldest and largest development finance institution. He is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Bankers of Nigeria and draws on significant work experience gained in both the corporate and banking sectors during the course of his 30-year career. And our third guest is Ms. Jane Karuku, the Group Managing Director and CEO of East African Breweries Limited. Ms. Karuku is a dynamic business leader with strong management experience spanning over 20 years in FMCG and non-governmental organizations. Her experience straddles strategy development, operational management, marketing, as well as organizational change management. Together and in the next 40 minutes or so, we'll tackle the topic, power and potential of women's leadership in business and, and, Af and business and government, an African perspective. For opening remarks ahead of this discussion, I have the pleasure to invite Ms. Soramidayo George to say a few words. Ms. George is board chair of the UN Global Compact Nigeria. She is the director of corporate affairs and sustainable business for Unilever Ghana and Nigeria, and has prior working experience in sectors cutting across banking and nonprofit organizations. Welcome, Ms. George, and over to you. Thank you very much. Um, the CEO and Executive Director of the UN United Nations Global Compact, other officials and distinguished members of the UNGC here present, representatives of UN agencies and all local networks, members of the African Union, representatives of private and public sectors, government officials, captains of industries, ladies and gentlemen, all other protocols duly observed. It is my honor and delight to welcome you to the Africa Plenary Session of the 2021 United Nations Global Compact Leaders, um, Leaders Summit. As the first post-COVID-19 Leaders Summit, this year's summit holds a deep significance to us at the UN Global Compact in Africa, and indeed to the rest of the world, more so in view of a decade of action. The theme for this plenary session, the power and potential of women's leadership in government and business and African perspective presents us with a timely and highly germane issue of global relevance for our honest deliberation and concerted effort. Since 2015, there has been some progress towards urging gender equality and women empowerment in the fabric of African governance, business and society. While we may have come some way from where we began, it is not Uhuru yet. There is still a lot of work for us to do, including increasing the number of women in leadership positions in both the public and private sector, while encouraging more collaborations between women and women networks across continents to finding solutions to many of the world's development challenges, and also pushing for more concerted action in the area of social equity. We continue to make our voices heard for all hands to be on deck to help us women to harness and achieve our full potential. Beyond its more visible effects on international travel, trade and commerce, COVID-19 has had deeper and more insidious effects on in our collective progress towards achieving the 17 sustainable development goals, especially with regards to women's rights and gender equality. The fallout in the months that followed revealed how deeply gender inequality remains embedded in Africa's political and socioeconomic systems. In the famous words of Antonio Guterres, distinguished UN Secretary General, COVID-19 is a crisis with a woman's face. Yet with every crisis, I must say, comes opportunity. There has never been a better moment for Africa and the world to collectively reflect, strategize, and adopt a truly holistic and effective 
sustainable approach to gender equality going forward. The UN Global Compact, the world's largest sustainable initiative, offers crucial support to both government and businesses in this regard through two key initiatives, namely Target Gender Equality and Women Empowerment Principles, WEPS. Target Gender Equality, TGE, is a gender equality accelerator program designed to support companies engaged with the UN Global Compact in setting and reaching ambitious corporate targets for women's representation and leadership, starting with the board and executive management levels. WEPS, on the other hand, are a set of principles offering guidance to business on how to promote gender equality and women's empowerment in the workplace, marketplace, and within our communities. It was established by the UN Global Compact and the UN Women, and also was informed by international labor and human rights standards, grounded in the recognition that businesses have a stake in and a responsibility for gender equality and women's empowerment. Let me use this opportunity, ladies and gentlemen, to invite all companies to sign up to WEPS as it is a primary vehicle for corporate organizations delivering on gender equality dimensions of the 2030 agenda by joining the WEPS community. CEOs signal commitment to this agenda at the highest levels of the company and will work collaboratively in multi-stakeholder networks to foster business practices that empower women. In conclusion, our theme today calls for a serious reassessment of organizational policy, culture, and operations by both businesses and government. Every African government and business organization was realized that the great expectations upon us will only be achieved by true gender equality in all spheres of our existence and endeavor. Without drastic action in this direction, the African community would have failed not only this present generation, but also generations to come. We must therefore take our place. We must stand tall at the forefront of the discourse and fight for gender equality and gender transformative disruption. The task before us is great and it does not end here. Beyond all conversations held in this regard, we must translate our acquired knowledge and reawaken consciousness into tangible action, aligning efforts and measuring progress with the initiatives and tools provided by the UN Global Compact. I call on all our compact, I call on all our members to set ambitious corporate targets for gender equality by signing up to target gender equality and the webs. We look forward to deeply insightful conversations filled with genuine hope that is matched by real intent to drive lasting change and anticipate a demonstration of the African spirit of unity, collective action, and, and a relentless march towards greatness. God bless Africa. Thank you all once again. Thank you, Ms. Sora Midaya George, the board chair of UN Global Compact Nigeria, for your insightful opening, uh, reflecting on the importance of advancing gender equality, looking at the role of women's leadership in driving sustainable change, as well as the UN Global Compact's commitment to mobilizing business to achieve SDG 5. Time now to get into the panel discussion with our panelists, Her Excellency, Dr. Monique Nsanza Baganwa, the deputy Chairperson of the African Union Commission, Mr. Olu Kayode Pitten, the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Bank of Industry, and Ms. Jane Karuku, the Group Managing Director and CEO of East African Breweries Limited. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. The discussion will begin with pre recorded video commentaries by other women leaders from across the continent. After viewing the recording, all three of our panelists will have an opportunity to respond to questions that I will pose, and you will have approximately three minutes to answer each question. So let's begin with our first video recorded by Her Excellency, the Deputy Minister of ICT in Namibia, Ms. Emma Theophilus. 
All our systems, our banking systems, our political systems are patriarchal in nature, and they continue to hold women back. And, and financing still remains one of those biggest issues, although it's not the only one. So if we have, for example, more women in public office who are able to um, create systems and create policies that allow more women to have access to fin financing, for example, either for their education or their businesses or entrepreneurial activities, we can have a great emancipation of women um, that are able to take care of their needs um, and, and that of their dependents, particularly children in this case, um, as it is in, in, in most countries. So with that, enabling environment, uh, it becomes easier for women to, to, to actually uh, understand the needs of other women and actually uh, contribute um, to changing systems that might not take uh, a few years to, to, to over overturn, but I think the beginning of, of, of women being in those spaces is the beginning of those systems getting their time run out. That's why representation is important and why it's important to to empower more women to take up those spaces in public office and political decision-making positions so that they're able to overturn patriarchal systems that continue to hold women back. And that was Her Excellency, the Deputy Minister of ICT in Namibia, Ms. Emma Theophilus. And as you heard her talking about patriarchal systems and access to financing for women's education and uh, businesses. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the panel, from your perspective, how are business and governments working together to overcome barriers to gender equality and, and pave the way and path for women's leadership sector across sectors and, and geographies? And I'd like to start with you, Your Excellency, uh, Dr. Monique Nsanza Baganwa. Thank you so much, um, first of all, to have me. Uh, governments and private sectors um, are great, actually, partners and players to deliver for women. It starts by policy frameworks, which I consider like the highways. These policy frameworks must include the views of the private sector because they are, the, they are on the field and they understand what it takes. Then when you have these highways, you need cars, you need uh, bicycles to, to actually drive on those highways. And these are delivered through the private sector investments. Again, uh, the private sector uh, plays a, a key role, not only uh, uh, by, by delivering their products and services on, on commercial terms, but we've seen also private sector coming forward uh, to engage with governments to solve some of the developmental issues. For instance, uh, one of the programs we have the, with the Auda NEPAD, which is our implementing agency of the African Union, uh, there is this program of the 100,000 um, um, uh, SMEs uh, that uh, we are talking about, uh, which is being implemented uh, with the support or the collaboration of Pan-African banks and other players. So it's key uh, to, to have this partnership we have uh, seen also funds being raised and, uh, and other initiatives. So that's one of uh, the ways uh, actually they do partner. And uh, it's something that is encouraged at the Pan-African level, uh, but also uh, at the local national levels. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, you know, you, you talked a lot about the private sector and perhaps bring in uh, Mr. Olukuyode, Olu Kayode Pitten uh, online now, sir, to respond, especially from, from, from the perspective of private sector. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, you're right. Uh, there are many challenges that women face in leadership uh, in Africa, especially maybe in government or in business, uh, social, cultural barriers, uh, people want to invest more on the male child than the female, and any life type of education that the women get in Africa, uh, they are not uh, represented in this term, you know, talking of uh, science, technology, engineering, uh, mathematics, you know, uh, collateral issues, you know, to even be able to borrow money. Uh, most of the assets, uh, the men actually have these assets, 
and they don't have the network that the men have. Uh, I had the biggest DFI in Nigeria. And this problem is not only uh, a Nigerian problem, but an African problem, to a large extent also, is worldwide. So what have we done? After seeing this, we actually went out of our way to create a desk called the gender desk. And that gender desk is just to cater for women-owned businesses and women-led businesses. It's been quite successful. This was done in 2015, the first bank to do it in the country. Uh, from that time till now, we have disbursed to women-owned businesses over 265 million US dollars to over 1,500 female-owned businesses. Uh, there's another program that the government has, uh, which is called the JEEP. Uh, and basically, uh, this is mainly for women and traders and artisans. And that also we have disbursed over $300 million. Uh, so that is very helpful, you know. So I think to help women, uh, we need to actually be more practical. They have been disadvantaged for a long time, you know. We don't only have to talk about it. You have to put in place programs that will empower them. And we had found out as bankers that actually women are better people uh, to bank than the men. They pay their loans better and faster than the men. So actually banking women is good business. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pitton. Talking about practical examples of, of how we empower our women across sectors, I'd like to hear from you now, Ms. Jane Karuku. Perhaps share with us of you know, some of the examples you have about how women can overcome such barriers. So thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you for having me. I think listening to my colleagues, they are all both very correct. And I think the first thing from a private sector perspective is policy and also being very deliberate about the actions that you want to do. So where I work, for example, we've said and we've committed as a leadership right from the global perspective that our consumers are 50-50. We have the world is 50-50 from a gender perspective. The second thing is that that's where we are going to get our employees, not just consumers. And the third thing is to our gentleman colleague has said that women tend to be more well-rounded. So therefore it's in our interest as a business to make sure that we are getting more gender balanced in the workplace. And the first thing we did is to be deliberate and got targets, give ourselves targets. Targets in terms of uh, looking at all our processes of recruitment and being very deliberate at every stage, whether it is at interview stage, whether it's supporting people in college, or whether it's a leadership representation and said, took a target that by 2030, we want to be 50-50 in the business. And we've taken this from the lowest level of the organization up to the board level. And over the last five years, we've made very great, very good progress as we embarked on this journey. The other thing is to make sure that we have championship champions in the business. This war is not going to be fought alone. We need the male colleagues to do that. And we have, amongst our business, the biggest uh, drivers for representation on gender are our male colleagues. And then the third thing we do is a lot of capability training for leadership, because there's something which is quite serious, which we tend to ignore, which is gender bias. You always hear the first statement, which is very disempowering, like women can't do this, women can't do math, women can't do this, uh, women can't pay back a bank loan. Uh, it, et cetera, et cetera. So our society is full of biases. So I think we have to be intentional at lifting the unconscious biases that exist with us, in, within us. And then lastly, I think we do need to train to make sure that the women are fit for the roles that they are going to get. So it's not about making sure that your gender parity in the organization, but also make sure from a capability perspective, it is going to over deliver on the commitments. And therefore we can role model as women to other women from girls and as young as they can be to other people within the corporate setting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Karuka. What I've been taking out of this is a whole of, of, of society approach. If we 
if we, we will go a long way together, um, you know, a longer way when we go together, perhaps being deliberate, taking what you've said about being deliberate about actions, about targets, and, uh, and Mr. Pitten, stopping the talk and taking action. That's the only way we actually get to see results. So let's move into our next question, which focuses on the impact that COVID-19 has had on the barriers to gender equality and women's leadership. Before we get your response to this issue, let's hear first from Ms. May Abul Naga, the first sub-governor of the Central Bank of Egypt. We started implementing a set of initiatives at the Central Bank and a set of programs that aim to help women grow and qualify them to climb the career ladder confidently and to remove any barriers that hinder equality at the workplace. We introduced in our new HR policy uh, issues that were also mandated by the COVID uh, circumstances such as the work from home uh, set up for women on childcare leave, part-time job, paternity leave. This is all very new in Egypt. And we are studying the potential to avail subsidized nearby childcare facility. Uh, we are optimistic and we are confident that by sustaining these initiatives along with raising gender diversity awareness, that this will yield a cohort of accomplished females. And that was Ms. May Abul Naga, the first sub-governor of the Central Bank of uh, Egypt, pointing out the barriers to gender equality and women's leadership, and that they've only been exacerbated by COVID-19 from the increase in care responsibilities that disproportionately fall to women to the digital divide, which left girls without access to educational opportunities. As you very well know, our classrooms turned vi uh, virtual. So to our panelists, I'd like to know what is your organization doing and perhaps what more needs to be done to ensure that we won't backtrack on progress that we've made. And, and this time I'd like to begin with you, Ms. Jane Karuku. Okay, so thank you very much. So I think for this to be sustainable and into the future, we've done several things and we keep saying that some of these change brought about by COVID-19 will be sticky into the future. I think the first one is flexi working. I think a lot of us have been working from home and from very many other stations because we just can't work in the office. So we've invested in technology to ensure that I can work from wherever I am and I can be effective. I think the other thing is mindset. I think we all believe that we needed to, to get to the office. We needed to keep seeing each other so we can be accountable. I think we are learning to be accountable and deliver on objectives when we are far, far away from the office. I think the third thing is working as teams. I think what I've observed during COVID is that the teams have become stronger because smaller teams get together, whether it's Zoom or Teams or the interesting gizmos that we have uh, being innovated uh, very, very quickly. We tend to make it work. And, and I think some of these will stick. So we've discovered there's some work we can actually collaborate out of the office. However, there is some human connection that we do need that we need to go back to the office. I think the second thing, I mean, the, the other important thing is that we've also learned as individuals that we need to multitask. And I'm talking particularly in a gender perspective. If you take a typical woman, they have so many responsibilities, particularly during COVID. They have to take care of their immediate family, their extended family, their communities, and they have work to deliver. So some of those qualities that women already had have come to bear very strongly. For example, the compassion, the multi-skilling, the good communicators, because women are very, uh, are very good communi communicators. They listen and they are quite empathetic. And I've also discovered they have a high degree of emotional intelligence. So given that very complicated uh, life that women and we've found ourselves in, we're able to work from home with the kids crying in the background. A lot of my colleagues, when you have these conversations, you can see the kids running in front of Zoom, the dogs and other, and other interesting stuff that happen within, uh, within the house. But at the end of the day, we are learning to deliver because we still need to, 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 to deliver for ourselves. And lastly, taking care of ourselves. Women hardly take care of themselves because they're always taking care of other people. 
I think during COVID we've discovered there's a woman, if you don't take care of yourselves, you struggle either mental health or even other diseases because you're occupied from very early in the morning until late in the day. So I would say that uh, several things will change. I think the bias is going to start changing against women because we are working within that complicated environment. Technology has to keep supporting us. The attitude towards ourselves and within the organizations and enjoying flexi working time, which probably will lead to better productivity as we keep innovating in more technology. And I think if you look at the SDG, SDGs going to the future, particularly the ones on gender equality, I think it will help. COVID will, I think will fast track that agenda and the one of giving people decent places to work in because of technology. And lastly, as a business, a, a year, about 18 months ago, we changed maternity uh, leave and we went up to I think seven months, including also paternity leave to more than a month. And that is really also getting to be very inclusive from a diversity perspective, that I can be what I need to do as a family person, but I can also be uh, prepare myself to get back to the corporate world and really deliver. So thank you very much. I think that would be those would be the things that I take out. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kuruku. I'd like to hear from you now, uh, Your Excellency, Excellency Dr. Monique Nsanza Baganwa. What, what, what do you think needs to be done and urgently done to make sure, number one, we don't backtrack on the progress that we've made and we accelerate towards a more inclusive and equitable future? Thank you so much. The first thing in this period, in this era of uh, COVID-19, uh, is to make sure that we stay healthy. That's priority number one for our leaders, for our countries, uh, for all the citizens of, of Africa. And we've seen, and with pride, that actually the Africa, uh, with the, um, I would say, the, the, the arrangement, um, uh, spearheaded by the African Union uh, machinery from the leadership to, to Africa CDC and other departments, we have been one of the parts of the world that has been actually well organized and worked in solidarity, in unity to, to combat the, the COVID. I think this solidarity, this unit needs to, 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 to continue. This ownership of the political policy makers needs uh, to continue. Uh, second, not just uh, the, the policy, but the vaccines. Uh, you know, we, we needed to continue um, actually um, expanding the access to vaccines for all. I think that's really one of the priorities. Uh, we need also to keep actually making progress on digital transformation. You know, we are talking of taking the kids back to school, in a, in a situation of COVID, but we must think about some of the areas in our countries that are very remote, uh, very uh, not yet accessible in terms of those uh, facilities, that work has to continue. And uh, what is good is uh, there is uh, already uh, programs in place for that. We need to continue um, uh, actually navigating this uh, uh, at the national level and at the African Union, we need to continue monitoring that we are making progress and supporting uh, each other, and also creating avenues for the private sector, from the philanthropy, for, for civil society and the communities to, to find their ways in this. We need to, for instance, make sure our Africa continental free trade area works because you need to create livelihoods, you, we, we need to trade, we need um, uh, to, to cross borders, but how do we do it safely and healthy uh, as people? So all that is the work that needs to, to, to continue. Uh, you know, we have this as a, a decade for women, especially focusing on the financial inclusion and also economic empowerment, the 2020 to 2030. That's again one area that uh, uh, we, are, we are focusing on. And we've seen the uh, two funds being created, a trust fund for, for women, including women at the grassroots. That one is going to really help uh, in the recovery process, in the resilience of the economies and the communities. We have also another one on the youth side and uh, programs to actually continue uh, supporting our youth to take uh, part in the economy and society. 
we have another interesting framework of uh, Women Leaders Network. This is uh, an avenue to keep women in the leadership engaged on the continent, supporting each other, coming up with new ideas, and also mentoring the youth so that we take charge of, of the solutions. We need to continue advocating for women to participate in the decisions about the recovery. Not only the decisions, but also the monitoring of the impact. Some of the programs that uh, the governments have implemented have, have created. We needed to bring on the table corrective measures. We need to keep challenging our, our, our financials. I see my brother there, and I'm so happy coming from the financial sector myself to hear the message you're putting across. We wish these messages to, to really keep expanding. And from my experience, everyone has the goodwill. They have, they, they proclaim that they want to do these things. But in actual fact, it gets complicated. It gets more complex than it is on paper or pronounced. So we need also to keep uh, enhancing the capabilities of people to actually do gender mainstreaming and, uh, and uh, implement programs that really are catering for women. And having women perspectives in the design, but also uh, put in place mechanisms to monitor. Statistics are very, very important. I always come back to this point that if you don't measure it, then you don't care for it. And you want to know when it's time to adjust or when it's a good really to continue emulating that. So that's one of some of the things that um, we need to see uh, continue. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. And uh, you, uh, Mr. Patan, what is your response to what needs to be done and urgency, urgently so, so that we don't backtrack on the progress made? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you've had a lot of good points from uh, uh, my sisters. Uh, but one thing that we need to note is that Africa is the only region in the world where more women choose to be entrepreneurs than work for somebody else. So actually, there are more women, uh, business uh, women in Africa than in any other region of the world. The question is, why? It's because most of these women would not have been employed formally. They have families to take care of. So they have decided on their own to go out there and get something done. So when you now talk of COVID, you know, COVID affected women more in Africa. Why? Most of those businesses are small businesses. These women are going out there every day trying to get something for their families. Now, that also has other implications. Now we've gone virtual. Most people now are working virtually. Most of these women don't have the education to work virtually. So it means under COVID-19, many of their businesses were the most affected. Many of them are selling food items, different kinds of things. The ones that did not thrive that much under COVID-19. So things have become more difficult for their families, which means the type of education that these women will get, that we're talking about going forward, STEM, you know, uh, it will help them in the future. But for now, something has to be done. They are also the most vulnerable. Why? Because most of their businesses, they cannot afford to sit at home for one month to get money. Many of them, they have to go out daily to get paid. Under COVID, they are not protected. So many of them, vaccine or no vaccine, you know, uh, mm -hmm. they have to go out there to feed the family. So most of the deaths also, fortunately, I don't know how, uh, men die more than the women, but the women are out there every day doing this. So what can we do? It comes down to finding creative ways to help fund these women businesses, the small ones. Mm -hmm. There is a program that AFDB is doing. Uh, we're working with them, the AFAWA, the Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa, how women can get 
more funding, and my bank has signed up to that. There's another program that is being done by the uh, Islamic Development Bank. It's called the BRAVE program. Uh, it means business resilience assistance for value adding services for women, you know, which is a good program because it targets uh, women in a vulnerable uh, areas and pilot being done in Nigeria and a few other countries also have signed up to that. There is a fund called Alethea Fund for $100 million and basically run by women and is targeting supporting women-owned businesses in 10 African countries, uh, Malawi, Lesotho, uh, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Ghana, and Nigeria. It's a $100 million fund. My bank put in $10 million uh, into that uh, project to help. And finally, uh, there's a group of women in Nigeria now who have come together, and they want to set up a bank owned by women and catering essentially to women. And we also, as a bank, we have told them we're going to support them. So our women are vulnerable. Uh, they are working very hard. Most of their businesses, they have to go out every day. Under COVID-19, they are very vulnerable, you know, and we have to do everything to help, uh, to support them, and to protect them for the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pitan. In our final video, we're going to look at the issue of empathy and leadership traits. Let's listen to commentary now by Ms. Christine Umutoni, who is the United Nations Resident Coordinator for Mauritius and Seychelles. The fact that we are caregivers, uh, that we are community workers, that we empathize, those should be positive traits that we can build on to amplify us, but not to squash us. Unfortunately, uh, the society holds that and thinks that since you are a caregiver, you can only be the Minister of Social Affairs. You cannot be the Prime Minister. But a Prime Minister can be that person with the heart of a caregiver. Actually, society requires those empathy. I don't know why people relate empathy to pity rather than to leadership. You cannot lead a people that you don't believe in, that you don't have empathy for. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was uh, Ms. Christine Umutoni, United Nations Resident Coordinator for Mauritius and Seychelles. We've fast run out of time, but I want to give each of our panelists 30 seconds to talk about, aside from empathy and other leadership skills are critical, what, what are the other critical skills do you believe that women consistently bring to the table but are overlooked? This time, I'll start with the gentleman, Mr. Pitan. It's over to you, 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, women have what I call the sixth or the seventh sense. They, they see what men don't see. And uh, somebody said once that uh, in a football match, when you play with half of the team, you cannot win. In most countries, women are 50-50 or 60-40. So why do you go into a match with half of the team? You know, if you want to win, you have to work with everybody. And if you don't allow the women to bring that sixth sense, and it has been proven, anywhere you have them as part of management, the company does better, you know? And we, can, we have seen quality management at a high level in Germany, uh, America, you know? Uh, so it's, it makes good sense to work with the women and to encourage them to be in leadership positions. Thank you. And tongue in cheek, maybe our women football teams can get equity in earning. But we don't have time for that now. Let's get to you, Ms. Jane Karuku. What other critical skills do you believe that women bring to the table and are overlooked? I think I'll start by the hard work. I think women are the most hardworking of creatures around. And, and in summary, I think they lead with the three brains. They lead with the head, the heart, and the gut. And therefore, they, they tend to be quite balanced. Thank you, Ms. Kuruku. And finally, Your Excellency, Dr. Monique Nsanza Baganwa, over to you. How do you respond? Resilience and, uh, and uh, persistence. Resilience uh, is, uh, is a, um, a trait that helps also in risk mitigation. 
while persistent, uh, persistence is key for implementation. You never settle for anything less than, than perfect. Thank you very much. And with that, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude this afternoon's panel discussion, which was an African perspective on the power and potential of women's leadership in government and business. With thanks to our guests, Masora Mudiaya George, board chair of the UN Global Compact Network Nigeria, Her Excellency Dr. Monique Nsanza Baganwa, the deputy chair of the African Union Commission, Mr. Olukayode Pitten, the managing director and chief executive officer of the Bank of Industry, and Ms. Jane Karuku, the group managing director and CEO of East African Breweries Limited. From me, Krivani Pillay, enjoy the rest of this UN Global Compact Leadership a Leaders Summit, and let's continue in our collective endeavor to leave no one behind. Over to you, Veronica. Thank you.